There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. What is what makes you successful as an investor is the exact opposite of what makes you successful in the rest of your life. Hey friends, Shauna here. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money. This is a show that helps you deal with the complex, irrational, and oftentimes annoying emotions around money so you can get in a better relationship with money, stress less, and start thriving financially. If you're ready, let's jump in. Have you ever said to yourself, it's too late for me to learn about money. I'll never know enough to get ahead. Or I've made too many mistakes. I will always be in debt. Or if I just made more money, I'd be a lot happier. These are very common beliefs that we share about money. Just the other day, I was having a conversation with a friend and she said, Shauna, I'm just tired. I'm in my 40s and I haven't saved enough money. I feel like a real failure. So she inspired this episode because I think it's time we talk about these money beliefs that really hold us back. You know, one of the things that I love most about hosting the show for the last nine years is getting to make some really great friends who also host equally amazing money podcasts and bringing them all together to talk about money topics that I know are top of mind for you, like this episode. Jordan Grummet, aka Doc G, host of the Earn and Invest podcast, and Joe Salcihai, host of the Stacking Benjamin Show, are joining me to shatter these common money beliefs so they can no longer hold you back from reaching your goals. Before we jump into the episode, just a reminder, I am going to be releasing my signature course on Fuck Your Money mid-March, and I'm opening this up to 20 people who want to join me for five weeks. We're going to have weekly live Zoom hangout sessions and you're going to have access to all of the pre-recorded course materials. If you want to get on the wait list, head to etmpod.link slash money course, or write in the show notes, the link will be right there. I would love to have you join me. This is the time that you can start changing how you think, act, and feel about money so you can actually achieve the things you want to. All right, if you're ready to finally start changing all of these money beliefs that keep tripping you up, Let's start talking. I know I'm ready. I have had a lot of people reach out to me over the years and say something like, it's too late for me when it comes to money. I didn't learn anything and now I'm in my 30s or 40s and I just feel like it's too late. So 
it got me thinking about this idea of these false money beliefs that kind of hold us all hostage and these things that just, you know, rumorate in our heads, right? And we never actually speak them out loud, but they they get in the way of us making progress towards our goals or making healthy choices around money, whatever it might be. And so I thought it would be fun to just talk about some of these together because I know both of you have probably heard your fair share of money beliefs that that people uh, just kind of have stuck inside of them. So I, I wanted to start out with this one because I have heard this so much lately, this idea of it being too late. And we all know it's it's never too late. Obviously, the earlier you start certain things, the better, but it really isn't too late. So what, what do you guys think about this one? Like, How do we blow this belief out of the water? So I deal with this all the time because I am a hospice doctor. I take care of people when they are told that they have six months or less to live. And often they come to me and they say, oh, there are all these things I wanted to do in life and it's too late. And a lot of times after we manage their symptoms and all those kind of things, we actually can help them do something called a life review and find some reconciliation in those things they couldn't do. And in fact, often by the time people die, they've actually felt like they've made some headway, even on those things that they ignored most of their lives. So if the dying can figure it out in the last six months of their lives, I think the living need to give themselves more credit that although maybe they can't build the perfect financial framework that they're told that they should have, they probably can get a lot better. Yeah, Joe, like where do you think this belief comes from? I think I think it's an egotistical excuse. How about that? All uh, right, let, let's go there. <laughs> I had a I had a Harvard professor tell me once that uh regret is is a, a useless emotion. Like the, but, but and, and what I hear when people say that it's too late for me is this regret that I did not do what this other path with my life. And whether it's regretting saving enough or regretting the university you went to, regretting whatever the thing is, she made this great point, uh, Shauna, where she said she said that 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 regret's egotistical because it it you think that if you would have chosen a different path that would have gone better. And there is no affirmation that would have gone better. There's no assurance things would have been better. So even if you would have saved earlier, would your life have turned out the way that would you have experienced the stuff that you got to experience by that time? Because if you were so busy being focused on saving instead of living, you might not have shown up with these life experiences. So rather than do this useless regret emotion, there's that great phrase, and I've heard it attributed to many people, but I'll go with Winston Churchill, but I think there are several people that said this. Which is, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. But if you can't do that, that plant it right now. Joe, I love this regret issue too, because the truth of the matter is we look at regret and a lot of times we're talking about things that we couldn't have changed. And that's not really regret, that's disappointment. Like I'm disappointed that this thing happened, I couldn't have done anything about it. When you talk about regrets, you're actually talking about hopefully things we have agency over. So maybe instead of looking at them as regrets, it's actually a template for what we want to try to do in the future. So maybe instead of re it being a regret, it becomes our current plan or purpose for the future. And so we have a lot of agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's where the excitement is. And and actually, uh, 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 her point was specifically rather than spending a lot of time dealing with what happened in the past. Instead of focusing on making the right decision, do right by the decision that you made mm, right. and make the decision you made the right decision by following up on it and living it and being it and, and going 100% in that direction. So Jordan, I think that's exactly, that's exactly right on. How do you guys think we, we can work through the emotions of being left behind when it comes to money? Because you know it, it definitely brings up this sense of of I know anxiety for a lot of people, stress, maybe they don't even know how to articulate what it is. Maybe there's anger. Is it just this idea that you're saying, Joe, of just, okay, you you might feel this way, you might feel left behind, but do something today to counteract that or to change that or to, you know, make a step forward. Well, and I think the best way to kind of clear the table is to surround yourself with people that are going to lead you the way that you want to go. And and I love case studies where we take things from one part of our life and we 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 inform another part of our life with it. So I'll tell you one of those stories for me. I uh, I ran in high school and in college. That was a hundred pounds and a hundred years ago. 
but I, uh, I was a very good runner. And then I became a financial planner. I had this similar belief about my health that I think a lot of people do. I don't have time to work out, right? So many other things. So important. I got to be a dad. I got to be a husband and I got to work and then I'll work out, which is totally the wrong order. Because if you're not healthy, nobody's healthy. But I got fat and, uh, and, and I, I, I was so out of shape. We moved from Michigan to Texarkana. My friends that I just fell in with, which, you know, you think about all these little flukes, these little things happen in your life. Somehow I end up with these friends who are all marathoners. So I begin doing couch potato to 5k before I know it, I'm running my first marathon, which I would have told you then I didn't even care about running my first marathon. But when I finished it, I could not stop crying. I was crying and crying and I felt like such a pansy because I was so overwhelmed with emotion that I had done this amazing thing that I didn't realize I cared about far as, as much as I did. I've now run 11 marathons. So I think the idea of, you know, you tell yourself this, this, uh, keep repeating this. It's too late for me. I can't do anything. I can't do anything. Or you go find a, a bunch of people that are like you that are in your age group or doing the thing that you want to do, surround yourself with this noise. And next thing you know, they're lifting you up and it's a whole different narrative you're telling yourself, which I think is where this whole thing starts. I think there's an important point there because I think what Joe is saying is so true. It's surrounding yourself with the people who you aspire to be I think what happens to a lot of people is they don't feel like they belong in that room or in that group in the first place. And I think that's a little bit what you're getting to. And I think we have to go back to this idea of meaning. I think by deriving a sense of meaning of the hardships of our past, it helps us to move forward. So there's a narrative in our brain that says, I'm not good with money. I screwed it up in the past. But going back and looking at that narrative and saying, well, You know, I was bringing up kids. I was busy. I was helping my family members who really needed it, realizing that maybe you're the hero of that story and that maybe bad financial things happened, but you are not a bad person. It was bad circumstances. But now you're to this place where you're ready to step forward and do more. So how do we ascribe some heroism to that meaning to that past so that we feel like we belong in the room? In Joe's example, we feel like we have enough health and fitness to be in the same room with those people running marathons. And I think it's all about ascribing meaning. Wow. Okay. That felt a little bit like a mic drop moment. Uh, this early on in the conversation, I don't, I don't even know if that's allowed. Thank Jordan. you. We're done. Thank you. <laughs> we're done. That's it. <laughs> all right. This is all we need to say. <laughs> well, I want, I want to talk about a one money belief that you, that you shared with me, Jordan. Uh, you, you hear this a lot. You said, if I just have enough money, I'll be happy. And I think intuitively we all know this isn't true but it's so hard to not believe it you know specifically i think if we're in a situation where having more money would you know technically make a lot of things easier tell me a little bit about you know what do you say when people share this belief with you so you know i say what i think a lot of us say which is money solves money problems and when you have major money problems Money does do exactly what you want it to do. The problem is money problems are only a certain percentage of our life problems. And as we get more professional and we make more money and we get busier, I would almost say that they become less and less of those problems. And so if you're relying on money as a sort of mirage that keeps you from doing some of that harder other types of work, like who am I? What's important to me? What kind of effect do I have on the world? What does my legacy look like? If you're ignoring all those kind of things because money becomes the only thing you can see, you're going to find yourself very let down when you get to that place where you finally can say, I'm at that vaunted net worth. I have quote unquote enough money. And yet all those wonderful positive feelings I thought I was going to have aren't there. And so I, I had this in my own life. It's a very, very real palpable thing for me because at some point when I burned out in medicine as a practicing doctor, I convinced myself that I just got the money right. I could leave medicine and everything would be great. And then all of a sudden I realized that I had got the money right. I was there. I had enough money. And as opposed to having me become excited, I actually ended up having a panic attack and went down really the road of depression for quite a while because I had no idea who I actually wanted to be. My identity had become tied up first in being a doctor and then in having a certain amount of money. 
Uh, but none of those things were really sustaining me. And so that's why I think if we're not very careful, uh, we can end up in that place and find ourselves more unhappy than happy. Yeah, Joe. And I know you had you shared a, a similar belief that you hear a lot, kind of piggybacking on what Jordan said. If I just make a little more money, my cash problems will go away. And I know we both have worked with with people as money experts, and I'm sure we could share for hours stories where people, you know, had made, I don't know, a million dollars, two million dollars, three million. I mean, plug in whatever amount of money you want in there, and it's still not enough, right? You're still always kind of reaching for that next amount of money where you think, you know, your cash problems are are going to go away. Why why do we believe this? I don't know. It, it is so frustrating. I think it I think the internet makes it worse. I think social media makes it worse because we see people that have things that we don't have. And so then we buy into this lie that if I just have a little more money that I can get that thing and then I'll reach Jordan's finish line. And the bad news for us also as people is we tend to move our own goalposts. Like the person who makes 50,000 thinks, if I had 100,000, I'd be happy. You talk to the person making 100,000, like if I made 250, I'd be happy. Talk to the person bringing in a million, they're like, well, these other people are ahead of me making 3 million. Like the goalpost always move. And I think, I think that sucks the joy out of everything. Um, but, but the world around us is obsessed with, you know, who's ahead of us. And, and, and when 99 things go right in our life, right? I, I think that's also why we tend to dwell on the one thing that doesn't go well. I think it's also part of the human condition. <laughs> yeah. You know, 99% of my life is awesome and the 1% percent stinks. But I think, I think that opens up and changes when we realize it's not about making more. It's about divorcing, I think is the right word, divorcing our paycheck and the money we're bringing in from the amount of money we spend. And when we can then find that, that difference that how I spend money isn't related to my income, it's related to my joy. Then I start spending money differently. And then when I bring in money, that money then is much more flexible. Yeah. I often talk to people about this idea of what I call a happiness number. And, you know, it's this idea of like figuring out what is the amount of money actually that you need to make to sustain joy. I'll use your word, Joe. In, in your life. And for a lot of us, we are striving for goals and things that are relevant and important to other people that aren't actually important to us. And I think it's, you know, you have to really take a moment and pause and think about what do I really want in my life and what is the number associated with? It? Am I killing myself? You know, maybe like yourself, Jordan, am I killing myself to make X amount of dollars as a doctor or as, you know, fill in the blank with whatever? When I'm not really happy, maybe I could do another job and maybe I don't even want to live in a big city. Maybe I want to live, you know, somewhere else that makes me makes me happier. Uh, you know, I want to talk about this doubling down phenomena. The whole point of once I get to X level, I'm going to want 2X. There's a lot of hedonic adaption and what we call habituation, right? We have a certain happiness set point and we think that getting to that net worth or having that achievement it does improve our happiness set point for a short period of time, but we tend to habituate or fall back down. We know we've heard about the hedonic treadmill, but I think the same thing happens with achievements in general. We reach for achievements, we reach them, we feel better briefly, and then we habituate or fall back down. I was listening to Stephen Kotler the other day. He talks a lot about flow. And part of the issue is these are those quick dopamine hits. And I think when we have these achievements and we get to that net worth, we get a really quick dopamine hit neurochemically. It makes us feel good. But I don't know how much that's really associated with long-time happiness. I think long-time happiness has to do with a milieu of neurochemicals, including you know, norepinephrine and dopamine and a bunch of different ones. But in a sense, we're really looking at the slower, more purposeful, more gradual things we build in our lives. So we don't go from a happiness set point of five to a nine and stay there. Maybe a dopamine hit from a quick achievement will get us up to an eight, but we're going to fall back to that five really quickly. But when we start working on those deeper, more important things to us like purpose, I think we start creeping up to a 5.5 and a six and a 6.5. And so I, I think that's what we're really after. And, and we mistake money as one of those quick dopamine hits. And we keep on going after more and more of those. And it's not really fulfilling us. It's funny. Uh, there's, you know, often comedians are funny because they're so right. 
in, in what they talk about. No, it's annoying, right? <laughs> There's a great skit that Adam Sandler did on Saturday Night Live where he's a travel agent. And during the skit, he addresses the fact that they've had some negative reviews when they take people to Italy. And he says during the skit, he said, I just have to warn you, if your marriage is failing in the United States, it's still going to be failing in Rome. (laughs) If you're a very unhappy person living in Miami, you're going to be very unhappy person in Venice, right? You still show up. There's that old quote that no matter where you go, there you are. And I think we forget that happiness is not this finish line. It's this, uh, it's this, it's a state. When you talk about flow, Jordan, there's uh, some crossover to somebody I'm intensely interested in. She's singing off my song sheet. There's a woman who did a Ted talk, not a TEDx talk, but an actual Ted talk. Uh, uh, Catherine Price is her name. And she has a wonderful, um, uh, uh, discussion about the power of fun and about as, As adults, we don't chase fun. We hear the word fun. We think kids and ridiculousness. When you talk about the three pieces of of, of flow, which include flow, connection, and playfulness, those three things, trying to add those three things into your life, that, that you end up with more, Jordan, of what she calls true fun, these states in your life of, I am in the moment, I'm happy. And guess how much that actually has to do with money? Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So, how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T-O-S for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. 
That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash ETM for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. All right, Joe and Jordan, we're going to play your relationship with money is game. So first question, Joe, this one's for you. If you had to describe your relationship to money as a cartoon character, who would it be? I, I, I've I always loved the cartoon character, very old cartoon character, by the way, Betty Boop. And I think money to me is a little like Betty Boop, kind of seductive really flirty. There's times when I want to spend lavishly. There are other times where I'm a little annoyed. I'm like, no, 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 Betty. No, no, no. So, uh, (laughs) not today. today, I see what you're doing. (laughs) Nope. Not there. So for me, I'd say uh, my relationship definitely is uh, Betty Boop. We've not had Betty Boop before, so I I really, I I appreciate you kind of going into the vault for, for that answer. (laughs) That's what you get by having old guys on right there. (laughs) All right, Jordan, question number two, take us into the inner world of your money thoughts. What central theme? Oh, you don't want to know this. Oh boy. (laughs) What sort, what central theme or message kind of plays on repeat for you? I actually have the message. It's only money playing over and over in my head. And, And the reason why is, you know, my grandma was orphaned during the great flu pandemic in the 1917-1918 time period and grew up in an orphanage. And so for her, scarcity and having enough money was a big deal. And my mom, being her daughter, really had lots of those issues, although we always did okay. My dad died when we were young, so all of a sudden there was some economic trauma there. But we always had more than we needed, but it was a constant fear. And so I always have that script playing in the background. What if there's not enough money? What if there's not enough money? So my mantra has to be, it's only money. Like there are other things, there are relationships, there's achievements, there's love, there's all sorts of other things that are just important. And on some level, because it's irrational and I know the fear is irrational, I have to keep on reminding myself, it's just money. All right, Joe, question number three, guilty money splurge, you're never giving up. Oh, I, anybody who knows me knows that it's my addiction to board games. I just, and you know, what's funny is that it, it actually, as I'm, as I'm listening to this, um, this, this, this Catherine Price, uh, I'm listening to the audiobook now after I watched her, her Ted talk, um, uh, uh, connection, playfulness and flow. All three of those exist when I get a group of friends together and, and we dive into a game. We're, we're all having so much fun laughing about what each other are doing. We often get off on these tangents about just each other's lives. And it truly for me is a way to, com- to, um, to get more connection and to get lost in it um, in a very playful way. And so I don't think I'll ever give it up. And I already, everybody who knows me will tell you, I don't need to buy another one, but I will keep buying them. Joe even got Joe even got me playing board games. That's how, how I, much and you had fun, didn't you? And I did have fun. We had a great time. Yeah. He told me he thought he wouldn't have fun, and and I did, and, and I totally did. did. Is there is there a favorite board game? I just I just have to ask. Yeah, I have a few different ones, but the one that I'll that that I that I really really like the um uh there's a game called Viticulture that I really like where you own a winery. Speaking of wineries. It's, it's apparently winery day, but you, everybody owns a winery. It's super fun setting up your winery and, uh, shipping out orders for people and, um, uh, yeah, trying to build up, uh, uh, your winery to win. All right, Jordan, last question. You're getting all the, all the heavy ones today. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) I get Betty boop. (laughs) 
<laughs> What's uh, one money mistake that you wish you could get a do-over for? So my, I guess, huge money mistake was at the beginning of my career, when I was trying to decide what I wanted to do for a living, I had had some experience volunteering in hospice, and I somehow convinced myself that that shouldn't be what I did for a living. And part of that decision was you just don't make a lot of money doing that. So I thought I was going to be some super specialist, or at least I was going to do general internal medicine, but hospice doctors tend to make kind of at the lower end. And now as I look back, having burnt out of medicine and mostly left it, and the only part of medicine I still practice is hospice, I realized that if I had let go of concerns about money and just gone for what really filled me up, I probably would have made a lot less money, but I, my career longevity would have been a lot longer and I probably wouldn't have burned out and I probably would have enjoyed it a lot more. So I think that was a probably the my sentinel money mistake um, if I were to pick just one. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The hosts, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks, where they explain how you get started right away. And back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. From Foreign Policy, I'm Rena Ninen, the host of the Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. Over the past few years, we've looked at how women around the world are changing societal norms to increase their economic power. This season, we're focusing completely on girls how they're pushing for a brighter, more powerful future, and what the rest of us can do to set them up for success. Join us for stories about girl power, young women who are fighting for change, to give themselves a chance to live a life of their own choosing. That's season six of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, you know, this is something that I struggle with a bit. Um, you know, I moved across country from Los Angeles to Asheville to be in more nature and to have more space. And so, you know, I've, I've been doing my best to get outside every day. We have a dog. So, you know, we walk her, play with her and look at the trees and look at the stars and and all of that. But I don't have a lot of play or fun in in my life. And it's been a real struggle for me to even figure out what those elements look like. And then also to think about, do I actually need to be spending money to have play or to have fun in my life? Like, how do I, how do I figure that out? And Jordan, you brought up this, this idea of, of purpose, which I know you're, you're writing a book on this subject. And, you know, I think it's, it's such a big, heavy question, right? To figure out what the purpose of our life is supposed to be about. And I don't know about both of you, but I find the the later and later I get in my life, the more I, I just spend time thinking like, do I know my purpose? Am I doing my purpose? Am I not doing my purpose? You know, and it's just, it's like a head scratcher for me. Well, you know, it's interesting because you use the terms, I don't know if you meant to or not, you said purpose of life. So what researchers talk about is purpose in life. And I'd love to draw the distinction between those because purpose of life really almost sounds like one of these big ex existential difficult questions. Like, what is the purpose of my life? 
And I think that's where people go wrong is they associate this kind of big, audacious, change the world sense with purpose. And they're like, but I'm not doing any of that right now. And I don't know how to change the world. So this feels bad and I'm going to avoid it. But what researchers often look at is purpose in life, which is much more about doing those things that are deeply meaningful to you that hopefully eventually connect you to other people. And so when we're really talking about purpose, I think it really takes off a lot of the stress, fear, and anxiety if instead of making it this big audacious thing, we look at it as what are the things I like to do every day where I feel the most joy, maybe where I feel that sense of play, uh, where I don't feel pressure to get to some goal, but actually I'm enjoying the process of doing what I'm doing. And again, getting back to flow, what are these things that get me into that place of flow, of feeling kind of eternity and connected and in the moment? And so I think if we relieve ourselves of this big idea that purpose has to be this life-changing thing and instead look at it as what do we enjoy doing, what moves that happiness set point from the five to the 5.5 or six, not with the big dopamine hit, but that kind of slower essence of I'm being authentic, I'm being intentional, and I'm doing what I was meant to do, and it's connecting me to other people. Yeah. I, Joe, another personal favorite of mine that I think we need to address here is this idea that I, I don't need any help. I have the internet. <laughs> and I think, you know, when it comes to... Uh, money and the steps you need to take. Like, there's so much information out there now. I mean, it's crazy. It's you know, podcast podcasts and blogs and you know, courses and all sorts of stuff. And it isn't always what you should do in your situation, right? It's a lot of like just sort of generalized information. D tell me what this is about. This idea that you don't need any help. You, you have the internet. Yeah, this was the first one that came to mind when you when you uh, invited us uh, to this great discussion. Which th this is so frustrating to me. Back when I was a financial advisor, and I was haven't been one for a long time, but as I got better and better at my job, I had this realization one day that most of my top clients, my most successful clients, and I started looking for what are the what are the connections between these people? What are the dots? What are they doing really well that other people don't do well at? And you know what's interesting? My most successful clients could do my job. They did not, quote, need me. They had all that information, Shauna, that you're talking about. And they truly didn't hire me to, 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 to fill in the blank. Certainly, there were little blanks that I filled in often. They hired me as somebody who knew them, knew exactly what their goal was, and would fight with them, kind of like a Gordon Ramsay or a Simon Cowell will fight with you. Now, you know we can argue about Simon Cowell, so let's go to Gordon <laughs> Ramsay for a second. The assumption on Gordon Ramsay's cooking shows, and I'm going to assume people have watched a Gordon Ramsay cooking show where he goes into a kitchen and he always gets in a fight with the owners, right? But but there's this ground assumption which makes that those shows successful for so long as they were successful, which is he wants the restaurant to succeed. He wants these people to get where they're going to go. And he's fighting with them over the, the best path to get to that success. So it isn't that he dislikes these people and he wants to see them fail. He, he wants them to win and that's why they fight. And man, when you can have these creative differences with somebody who's on your team and who loves you, or at least respects you and knows you and really wants to see you win, but they will fight with you about the, the direction you're taking to reach that goal. How awesome is that? Like that is fantastic. And I found that these most successful people are super smart, can do it themselves, and they surround themselves with a lot of really smart other people. And it frustrates the heck out of me when I see online people go, no, 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 you don't need advisors. No, 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 you don't need these people. You, you, you got all these people. Are you kidding me? I'm going to ask somebody in a Facebook message group, Earl in Peoria, who might not know how to zip up his pants about what I should do with my 401k. Earl spends all day on Facebook. What does Earl know, right? How do I, I don't know anything about Earl's situation. Has Earl walked my walk? Does Earl know anything about anything? I, it, truly, it drives me, it isn't about information. And I think it's such a straw man argument that we get caught up in 
that we forget that surrounding ourselves with like-minded people who have our back is a huge key to success. And going back to Catherine Price and this play thing, I'm interested now in fun. She talks about this power of connection and it's another connection that you can make that can really help you get where you want to go quicker. And I mean, a huge part of this too is even if you made the argument that most financial information is digestible and the average person could digest it and learn it on the internet. Even if you made that argument, which I'm not even going to say is true, but let's say we make that argument as a given. We all still know that it's the mindset that gets in people's way. People trip themselves up. So you can say, I can learn it all on the internet. And that might be true, but nine out of 10 people will trip themselves up when the markets start going in directions they aren't expecting. And if you have a good advisor, they are going to save you so much money over and over again by having you not make a decision in the heat of the passion of something's going on and I'm going to miss the boat and lose all my money. I was thinking about that this morning, Jordan. Why, why do we mess up? our financial lives so much. And I think it's because what is what makes you successful as an investor is the exact opposite of what makes you successful in the rest of your life. Like we are, we are uh, 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 told time and time again that multitasking sucks. And it does suck. Multitasking d- takes the joy out of all the tasks you're trying to do at once. You end up, you know, there's a Stanford study that shows that you get there much slower when you multitask. Just do one thing at a time. And yet, if we do that with our financial goals, if I go after the goal in front of me, and then I go to the goal after that, and the goal after that, I realize that this power of compounding, which is so magical, gets erased, and I end up having to save dollar for dollar for these increasingly larger money goals, and I'll never reach any of them by not multitasking. I actually have to do the exact opposite of what's successful elsewhere. And then when it comes to the investing, then I get the money invested. We are we are uh, are better off if we act. You know, 99% of the time uh, when I saw successful people and still see successful people is people that make decisions more quickly. They move more quickly. They they go ahead and they fail. They fail the same percentage of the time, but they just have 100 actions in which 10% are failures versus the average person who has 10 actions. They continually are moving. With investing, if you're doing that in your accounts, you destroy yourself. The best thing to do in most circumstances, especially, Jordan, to your point, when the market goes down, if you're in the right investment, is to do nothing. And it's so against our nature. So I think it isn't, you know, I think a lot of us blame ourselves. I think it's because it's so contrarian to everything else that makes us human that is uh, the frustration behind why we why we truly i think need advisors to tell us whoa cowboy let's back off that well and not not to you know beat a drum here but i i mean i just keep going back to this idea that money is emotional and most of us don't understand how that impacts our decisions so even if we look at all the information online and listen to all the podcasts and read all the blogs and feel like we've got money figured out we don't need anyone to help us but we still get tripped up, right? And we're still listening to more podcasts. We're still reading more blogs and we're wondering why is nothing changing? And so when you talk about mindset and you talk about the irrationality of you know how we should be investing that is so counterintuitive, I think we just, we can't leave out of the conversation the emotions around money and how most of us just don't even understand the complexity of them. Well, and to that point, Shauna, I love that you said that because- even the day-to-day financial media uses words that make us more emotional. You know, a friend of mine told me once, what if you got into an elevator that operated in the same language that the day-to-day media talks about the stock market, right? It doesn't go down a little or go up a little. It soars or it plummets, <laughs> right? I mean, that is daily that the stock market soared today to new heights. The stock market plunged to a low, the Dow Jones, da da da. If I got in an elevator and my two choices were soar or plunge, I'd be on not just an emotional roller coaster. I'm like, I'm taking the damn stairs. Like, no, no, thank you. Yeah. And the last point I think that's really also important is when I kind of said, let's make it a given that you can actually look at the internet and figure out financial information. 
that still only holds for accumulation. Once you get to the point where you're decumulating, it gets so freaking complicated that you have to have an expert helping you figure out taxes and retirement and social security and required minimum distributions. I mean, we've got some really, really heady, smart people in our personal finance community, and it's only a tiny percentage of them that try to do that part alone. So do you do you both ever imagine a world where these kind of common money beliefs where they're not part of our relationship with money or are we just replicating these narratives over and over and over again and this is just going to be how we how we operate in the world around money I think I I think they're always going to be a part of it and the reason is I believe every single point you brought up Shauna has to do with a shortcut somebody thinks that they found I can I can cut out the middle person and not have help. If I just make more money, I don't need to budget. This crap about budgeting, oh my goodness, I'm just going to make more money, right? Like all these things are some perceived shortcut. And because there's always, and this is annoying, new people born every day. So annoying. When they just stop. <laughs> <laughs> some, some, because these things, this assembly line doesn't stop. We get somebody new in the community who goes, oh, wait, I think I found it. And then they go found, find the person who believed that before them, right? They find this, this historically online, and then they find that community of people. And then they wake up 15 years later and go, oh my goodness, I was wrong. I mean, just looking at the difference between me at age 25 and me now is, uh, is, is just, just amazing. The way I feel about the world is so different. There's so much more gray area than there was before. And it's so much more about community and connection and having advisors as many as I can freaking get, like the more coaches I can get in my life, the better. When I was 25, I was like, how could I have less coaches? Like, the, you know, if I could, if I could find the shortcut, well, the shortcut led me to fat and not working out. But when I then surrounded myself with people that had my back, that's when the marathon started again. Yeah. I mean, your your advisors help undo the trauma of your earlier years that lead you to make bad decisions because you've created these bad ways of coping because you went through bad stuff. And so what a coach will do or a financial advisor or someone who's advising you is they will undo that and make sure that the past doesn't equal the present. Because a lot of times we got to where we are by unfortunately making decisions that weren't always the best for us. And so like Joe says, I don't think this is ever going to change because I don't think anyone escapes unscathed. We all go through trauma. We have generational trauma. We have generational money trauma. And it keeps on rearing its ugly head generation after generation. I want to... Uh- I want to draw one point too, because I'm just imagining, Shauna, people, somebody listening to this podcast. And I always listen to podcasts with a fair amount of skepticism. And when you get three people on a podcast agreeing as much on advisors as we seem to be agreeing right now, you're walking along and you're like, what's in it for them? You know, because you read online, oh, they're taking your money, they're doing all this. I haven't been, I want to be clear here. I have not been an advisor in 15 years. I have nothing to do with, I don't care if you get an advisor or not. I don't make any money from saying you're going to be advisor. Doc G, Jordan is, 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 is not an advisor, has never been a financial advisor. And yet we, we're highly pro advisor. And I think hopefully, um, you know, I would be, I'd be, I'd just be a little skeptical if I heard three people agree, but this is an area that I'm not skeptical. What I am skeptical about is that when I see people that hire bad advisors, and then say that all advisors stink, I think your interview skills stink. And I think that you're not enough of the CEO of your financial house and you um, you you haven't done enough homework around what this advisor is going to do for you, which I think might be a different episode. But, but anyway. All right, let's, let's flip the page a minute as, as we kind of close out here. I'm curious to talk about what are some of the beliefs that we should all have around money? What are the things we actually should believe about money? Do you have you know, one or two, Jordan? Does something come to mind? Yeah. I mean, money is a great tool, not the only tool, but it is a great tool. It's not a goal. And so the more we think about money as a tool, one of the tools in our tool chest to help us do the things we want in life, the easier it is for us to then look at it with the right perspective. So it is a tool, but it is not the thing itself. So we all have to kind of get clear on what do we actually want out of life? Is that a family? Is that a house? Is that a hobby? Is that a certain job? 
all of these things are, are kind of the big issues. So let's remember what it is and then let's use that tool intelligently, right? Let's invest it and save it and budget it and use it to actually live the lives we want to live. I was reading a uh, another fantastic blog post from Morgan Housel yesterday. And Morgan had one that I really liked, which is that, you know, we talked about money and happiness and that the certain mile reaching these milestones won't make you happy. But he said that that money actually can make you happy, but it's often in in a nonlinear route. So he said, as an example, where, you know, having the bigger house to keep up with the Joneses and thinking, oh, if I just had this big house, then I'd be happy. That 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 probably won't make you happy. But having a place where you can host groups of people that you enjoy being with and having a comfortable place for people to gather and then create these memorable moments truly can make you happy. So and I think we have to I think we have to think carefully then about instead of looking forward, which I think is, is as you guys said earlier with purpose, Jordan and Shauna, that that kind of freaks us out. Look in the rearview mirror and see what you lit you up. And if I can spend more money on the things that lit me up and creating those circumstances and those opportunities to relight those fires, that that's probably a better pathway to spending money. Uh, I like that one. And I think, I think one more comes from uh, Jesse Meekum over at YNAB. And and Jesse talked about the power of if you can age your money like wine. And I love this this analogy. When I was really in financial trouble, I would get money in and it had to go right out. And I kept thinking, if I can just catch a freaking break. And then I realized that I had to do that divorce process I talked about earlier, which was I had to divorce my expenses from my income. And I had to build a gap between the two of those. But if I could take money and I could stick it somewhere and I could age it, that age money bought me flexibility. And I love that analogy that really, truly helps me want to stuff that wine cellar full of Benjamins, right? If I could put more money away, because the more money that I have, that I can then go at a time of opportunity or time of need into that cellar and I can grab that provision later, the more flexibility I buy myself. And while a lot of people are, are solving their financial lives for optimization, I think solving for flexibility is really truly where the key is to, uh, I think, better living. Let's go back to the top of the episode when Joe talked about what makes you successful as an investor is actually the direct opposite of what makes you successful in life. You can easily see how some of these common false money beliefs, they get embedded into your thinking. So your task this week, it's to dig into your thinking and beliefs. What pops up to the surface for you? What are you believing that isn't true, but it's holding you back from reaching your goals? Or what is holding you back from feeling a sense of peace or ease with your money? If you want to hear more engaging conversations like this one, or maybe you're just looking for a new podcast as a companion to everyone's talking money, head to the Earn and Invest podcast with Jordan Grummet or the Stacking Benjamin Show with Joe Salcija. I'll have all those links as well as the links to all of our episode sponsors who make the show possible right in the show notes. I'll see you right back here, my friends, in a few days for a brand new episode. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC.